It's your standard movie plot. A vulnerable hero is wrong or hurt by some sinister person. He or she gains strength from their anger to go out and try to avenge this wrongdoing. And in the end, the, the person, the villain is avenged. Justice is done. The credits roll. You see, revenge fantasies are so common in the movie industry that they become a genre all their own. Liam Neeson is always looking for a way to use his special set of skills in order to avenge a, a family member who has been kidnapped in the Taken series. Jason Bourne returned last year after nine years of absence to, uh, re to pour out his wrath on those who messed up his life. And who can forget Carrie from back in 1976 when in the eponymous book by Stephen King, the high school girl who was bullied seeks revenge on her classmates. Revenge is the plot of nearly every one of Quentin Tarantino's movies. And it's no coincidence that one of the most popular series out there right now is The Avengers. Revenge is sort of like a, that idea that we love because we love retributive justice. We like people getting their end, getting what's due to them. It appeals to our sense of fairness, you know, karma, that in the end, wrong is righted. Now, some psychologists suggest that revenge fantasies are actually good for us, that they're good for society. They say it's a reaction to that overlooked emotion called embitterment. Embitterment is that feeling of victimization coupled with the desire to fight back. And so, what the psychologists tell us is that because a person feels unable to really do something about it, we create revenge fantasies instead. And they say that it's good because it serves as a buffer for society, preventing people from actually seeking revenge and acting out in a negative way which could cause further repercussions and social disturbance. But that's why people then like these movies. Because they don't actually have to do something. Seeing that justice is done in the end is what counts. Now, truth be told, all of us have probably had revenge fantasies, albeit on a smaller scale, or, or at least I hope on a smaller scale. You know, you imagine getting revenge for that person who cut you off on the road. You have some elaborate uh, retribution that you plan for the boss who unfairly... Um, gave you a reprimand. You harbor plans of revenge uh, on that ex-spouse who caused you a lot of trouble. And how many of you have tapped out a, uh, a um, retort on social media for that person who heckled you and wisely didn't hit the send button or unwisely did hit the send button? The point is that we often run to these revenge fantasies whenever we feel that we have been treated unjustly. Now, Jesus, here at the very end of his Sermon on the Mount, wants us to know that even harboring such fantasies can lead one to action. Bad decisions like sending that email or that tweet or that message, which in turn can lead to our destruction. In this section of the Sermon on the Mount, 
Jesus talks about the Jewish system of retributive justice where you give the person what's their, what their due is. But what Jesus calls us to do is that instead of having embitterment, he calls his disciples to move to embodiment, embodying the will of God in his kingdom, living out the kingdom way in our daily lives. But what does this mean? Well, in our text, Jesus starts out by saying, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, pointing to that law of Moses that is built on this retributive judicial system. Unrestrained revenge is ruled out by that law of God. You can't go and kill someone because they stole your bunch of grapes. The commandment of God was designed to limit retributive justice to the crime that was committed, a grape for a grape. But in his Sermon on the Mount, though, Jesus even overrules this for his disciples, for his followers. He says, but I tell you, do not even resist an evil person. For Jesus, it's not about um, getting even with people. For Jesus, it was rejecting any kind of retaliatory violence. Vengeance, says Jesus, has no place in God's kingdom. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. So Jesus wanted his followers to reject the revenge fantasy in favor of a redemption factor for both the offender and the offended. Now, some people read this and you go, you got to be kidding, Pastor. We really can't live this in this world. This is not the way the world works. And you're right. This is not the way the world works. This is the way God's kingdom works. But this whole Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached to us, Jesus isn't fantasizing about the way life will be one day in the new heavens and the new earth. No, Jesus wants us to practice this, these principles in this life now. So as he says, we can be light in this world. You see... The problem with revenge is that it's all about making ourselves feel better and superior to the one who hurt us. Revenge is ego-centered. It's all about me. However, Jesus calls his followers to lean into the hard work of redemption through suffering love. Suffering the injustice for the sake of love. Followers of Jesus aren't to go about asserting their rights. In fact, Jesus says Christians have no rights at all. You should not see a Christian protesting for their rights. What he says the followers are to do is to respond in terms of the good and the needs of others, even when that other commits evil against them. That's hard. That's hard for us because people will take advantage of us. Well, did people take advantage of Jesus? Are we better than Jesus? Did Jesus ever say following him was going to be easy? If people follow Jesus because they think life is going to make life easier, 
they are greatly mistaken. Imagine the examples used in Matthew 5. If movies were made according to the Jesus principle rather than the standards of this world. Like in a Quentin Tarantino movie, if someone has a backhanded slap across the right cheek, what follows usually is an epic beatdown, right? But in Jesus' movie, being slapped across the cheek, the one who was slapped then would turn the other cheek to that person. Or suppose you're losing your shirt in a court case. The standard movie plot is to hire some hotshot lawyer who will turn the tables, or if that fails, then set out in another way to ruin that person. Jesus tells his followers that if they're losing their shirt, give them their pants as well. Because it's better to endure the shame of being naked than to seek revenge. There was a law at Jesus' time called Lex Ungaria, which required that if a Roman soldier asked you to carry their pack or some other burden, you had to do that for a mile, a Roman mile, mille passes, a thousand paces, and in two steps equal a pace, about 4,850 feet. Only after you carry that pack a mile were you allowed to set it down and return to your business. Jesus discourages his followers to seek revenge for this unjust law. He says, gladly pick up the burden and not only go a mile, go another milepasis with them. Because if you walk with your enemy for a mile and then another mile, you might not only walk with them, but perhaps talk with them. And who knows what might come of that? You know, some argue that these commandments of Jesus actually turn his followers into doormats for evil people. We're culturally conditioned to fight for our rights. Standing there doing nothing means that you're a weak person. No wonder Jesus' approach in this gospel seems so radical, so dysfunctional to our world. But rather than seeing these actions as a sign of weakness, Jesus actually calls them a sign of strength, a position of power. Because the way Jesus confronts evil is not through violence, but through nonviolent resistance that confounds, shames, and disarms the aggressor. Jesus' commandments are thus a foreshadowing of his own action on the cross and a way for us to live as his followers. It's not our responsibility. We can't trust in ourselves to set things right. <laughs> Ultimately, we have to trust in God's justice. And in that knowledge of God's justice, that's where we find the ability to follow God's command, to pray for our, to love our enemies, and pray for those who persecute us. For Jesus, this is the kind of love that he shared with us, that God shared with us, that while we were yet enemies of God, he died for us. It reminds us that God loved us while we were yet sinners. It reminds us that God's salvation is there for all, for the evil and the unrighteous, as well as for the so-called good and righteous. 
Ultimately, judgment is God's prerogative, and we can hardly claim to be better than any other person. When we're just as big a sinner, maybe bigger, it sounds counterintuitive. Love those who do not love you. Love the poor. Love your enemy. Love that co-worker. Love the liberal. Love the conservative. Love the person who is most unlike you. Sounds counterintuitive. But that reflects God's love for you. Don't be fooled. God is not soft on evil. God will ultimately avenge the evil in this world. He promises to do that. But unlike the swift vengeance of a two-hour movie, Scripture says that God is a slow avenger. God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God's slowness is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of perfect love. God withholds his wrath so that people have a chance to repent and return. If God gives us that chance, God will give it to our enemies as well. Because after all, we're their enemies in their sight. So revenge is never up to us. St. Paul says to the church in Rome, do not repay anyone evil, evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Bottom line, it's not up to us to dish out to offenders what they deserve. For indeed, this is not how God has dwelt with us. Instead, we are to be the embodiment of Christ in forgiving and loving them. We don't deal with evil by indulging in evil revenge fantasies, no matter how right we convince ourselves our cause is. We deal with evil by living the vision of God's offering love and forgiveness to all. Jesus demonstrates this all the way to the cross, where he says, while hung on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. He offers forgiveness and love to those who nailed him there. He overcame evil with suffering love. He overcame evil with good. So the next time you're at a movie, ask yourself how this would turn out differently if they would follow God's will instead. What would happen if the hero chose, decided to choose vision over violence, to choose redemption over revenge? And then take it down to a personal level. Who in your life do you still fantasize about getting revenge? 
How would the situation be different? How would you be different if you chose perfect love instead? This is the kind of action hero Jesus is looking for. And so may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.